um, I, I was a social studies teacher at, at North Gwinnett. And so when I graduated here, um, I actually was very fortunate and I had a job uh, right after graduation, which was in the beginning of, it was in the, the beginning of, in January of 2002. Now, um, one thing that I realized uh, along the way was that I still love music. I still love listening to music. I still had, I still played guitar every every chance I had uh, when I wasn't studying. Still performed for my friends when there, when there was an open mic at DTs. I would go down there and play every once in a while. And I realized that music was always going to be a part of who I was, whether I was whether I was making able to make any money out of it or not. It was something that was part of me. It was therapeutic. Uh, and the same same with writing. Um, it was something that in order for me to be happy, I was going to have to do it. And so. I went on to teaching, and the whole time, this was, you know, I, I, the majority of my time was spent uh, preparing for my classes. Um, over here on the side, I had this little bit of leisure time where I could actually write and practice and occasionally pick up a gig. And I began to love music in a different way. I wasn't playing music because um, I thought it was going to make me rich or famous. I was, I was simply writing because it was something that I felt compelled to do for me when I'm here. Um, and I look back now and I realize that's probably the biggest reason why I've had any success that I've had is because it came from a different place. It wasn't selfish. It wasn't, hey, everybody, look at me. Um, you know, so, so many times people say, oh, I've known, I've known I wanted to be a star since I was a little kid. You know, what does that mean? You've known that you were self-centered and wanted to be the center of attention since you were I mean, I'm not dissing that dream, and, and I think a lot of people have that dream, but then there becomes, there, there's a coming of age where a person has to grow up and face some facts and um, face, face some realities about themselves. And, and so I think the reason, that more than any other, that my songs began to resonate with people is because they, they, weren't, they weren't written in this selfish sort of, I want to cash in on you way. It was just me, a person who, um, you know, was adjusting to settling down, adjusting to the pressures of, of you know, becoming a middle class citizen. And I was just expressing myself, and I feel free to that. Now, when I was uh, in, my, in my first year of teaching, I started, um, I started playing music for my students. Uh, I played on, on Fridays, it was kind of like my way of uh, hanging the Sabbath feast, you know. Um, on Fridays, I would, I would tell everybody, hey, it's good all week, we'll play music on Fridays, and I would play songs. And when I first started doing that, I was really nervous. I thought that, you know, I was a decade older than all of the students. Um, they were listening to Top 40 radio, you know, and, and here I was bringing an acoustic guitar playing these songs that were more country than anything. I thought I was going to get made fun of or laughed at, and, I, you know, I, I, I started playing these songs that I'd written, and I found that kids were paying attention to me more then than they, than they were when I was teaching them. Um, wow, and they started encouraging me. They started saying stuff like, man, you know, Mr. Smith, why are you teaching? Why aren't you playing music? And, um, you know, it wasn't like I had just a big revelation, uh, but slowly, over time, those comments started kind of chipping away at me, and I started feeling this sort of sense of responsibility uh, to get back out there and see, see what happens. And um, so I started hitting the open mics again, um, and you know, just writing more and more songs. And eventually, I won the open mic contest in this little bitty, um, this little bitty coffee shop in Monroe, Georgia. It's called Cheetah Marie's, and it's not there anymore. Um, but they had open mic on Mondays, and I, I would go out there. And I remember every time I went, I always felt so, uh, so mediocre. You know, I felt like, wow, these people are all real artists, and I'm just, I'm a school teacher who can take guitar on the side, and you know, these people are a lot better than me. I'm, you know, and, and I was always insecure. But I'd go in there and, and give the old college try. Uh, eventually, I had this contest, and uh, I won this open mic contest. The, the grand prize was, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 hours studio time. Um, there weren't a lot of people in the contest, okay? <laughs> but I wanted to be. And I was happy, and I was thinking to myself, I was thinking to myself, great, I can go in the studio now. And now, and by that point, I think I've been writing since I was 18 or 19 years old. When I won that, I was 24, 25. Uh, so I had, you know, six, seven years of, of writing songs under my belt and had, had written over hundreds of songs. I mean, hundreds of songs, I'm sure. Most of which were horrible. But I'd written a lot of songs, and I get this prize, which is to go into a studio and, and uh, play some stuff down. So I had to, I got to pick from all those songs. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking when they write a song, 
it needs to be recorded and heard right there. Now, it's just not the case. It's just not, we need to write, the songwriters write many, many, many bad songs before they write a good song. And so another contributing factor, I think, to, to, to the success that I've had is the fact that by the time I got an opportunity to actually record anything, I'd gotten a chance to develop as a songwriter and make a lot of mistakes. And so I had some pretty decent songs to choose from. And I chose out of these hundreds of songs, I had 11 songs that I chose as, my, as a, the, the better ones and uh, record them. And, you know, it, in addition to the prize, I spent like 800 bucks in the studio. And the studio was, it was in uh, Oxford, Georgia. You probably know that is. Oxford, Georgia is like nothing. It's just like a stop sign. Uh, but there was a little studio there and I went in. And, so nervous the first day because I felt this pressure, um, this pressure like, I don't know, like, like when I went in, it was going to be something that was going to affect a lot of people. And I couldn't explain that at the time. Um, I, I, at that point, I never imagined what, what all's happened since then. But I will say there was definitely a tug in, in my heart that said, if you need to take this seriously and you need to go in because this is going to be a big moment. And so I did. And, and now I'll listen to the recordings and they make it cringe uh, for the most part. But again, I think they, uh, I think the reason songs like 21 uh, and The Sun Goes Down in Georgia and, and Love of the Memory, which are still my most, some of my most downloaded songs, that record that I recorded on an $800 budget is still by far our best selling record. Um, I think the reason for that is because I wasn't writing any of those songs with the intent of selling them. Um, and they weren't recorded with, the, with big production with the intent of you know, mass, distrib mass distribution. So I think it, it, it largely when people heard those recordings, um, they heard something very different than what they heard on the radio, um, which was this glitzy, elaborate production. You know, you can't go, to, you can't make a you know, country record or a pop record without spending tens of thousands of dollars. I did that with people. You know, it sounds like shit compared to a lot of stuff, but I think people dug it. You know, there's a lot of great albums that sound like shit, believe it or not. Um, so anyways, uh, so so I guess the next step of the story is I had a record, so I started going out and playing these little bars, um, and, you know, I made a couple hundred bucks a night, a couple hundred bucks here and there, and then the next thing I know, I had people um, to come to the shows who had gotten my record because what I was doing was I, I sold 80 records the first once once I had these records made um, I sold 80 records to my friends and family who and all my goal my goal was to just make the $800 back that I spent on the recording because I was now $800 in the hole and I won't be able to pay the house payment the next month unless I got my $800 back so I was like friends and family please don't let me lose my house you guys pay 10 bucks a pop, all I need to do is sell 80 of them, man. And it was a piece of cake. We just had a party one night, sold them all, and then I broke even. So now my first record is paid for, and ever since then, we have been firmly in the black. You know, that record has only made money since then. Now, people, my friends and family were taking it, and they were burning it. And I was telling them, hey, it's okay to burn it. Good. It's, it's all good. And the next thing you know, you know, I'm getting, when I play at a little bar in, in Jefferson, I've got people coming from uh, the Lonega and from, uh, from Athens and from Philadelphia. People are driving in because they somehow got this record. I remember the first time I played in Delonica, Georgia. I played this little bar called Busters, and I called there, and I had uh, I had no really no idea what to expect. I knew there were some friends of mine from Jefferson who went to school up there, uh, but other than that, I didn't know what to expect. And I told the bar, I called there, and I was like, just let me come play. Pay me 50 bucks, um, and uh, I'll come up there and play. And I'm like, okay, shit, just 50 bucks. So I go up there, and there's like you know 150 people there, and I I, I remember I was so nervous. I went to play the first the first song, and the crowd's singing along. What the? <laughs> it just spread that quickly over the campus, and I think that point I realized, um, wow, there's something to this. People actually like this outside of Jefferson. Um, and so, I'm, to make a long story short, since then, um, the same process has been continued. Um, making records, making on a low budget selling what we can, but also encouraging people to give it away and touring in a, in a larger and larger circle around my home uh, to build up a fan base. And uh, you know, eventually um, I got to the point with school where I was so busy touring, um, well not, not even touring really, I was only playing in North Georgia, so I don't know if you can call that touring or not. I was driving like an hour, you know, to at most to a gig. Uh, but I started getting so busy, um, I was being torn between school and music and I had to make that decision. Um, and I was 
put in, uh, in touch with Marty about the you know, universe, I guess. It's one of those things that we just, um, at, at the time when I met Marty, I was right in the middle of, of struggling with the decision to quit teaching or to keep playing music.